Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Zoom Into Wine. It's time for the show and your host, Ian Blackburn. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Stars of Rosé tasting. We're so happy to see you all. Thanks for joining us. We've got a wonderful audience. This is a sold out first night of Stars of Rosé. And uh, this is uh, the first time we've tried to do it, obviously, virtually. Uh, we've had some great success with the other tastings, so we're really pleased to see such a wonderful audience joining us tonight. Uh, on uh, the Zoom tonight, we have a large number of our winemakers and or winery representatives. They're going to take us through uh, quite an extensive tasting of seven different wines. I was running a few minutes late because it took me uh, it took me a little while to open up that container we put all that stuff in. Wow, that thing is tightly tightly uh, sewed together. It's the first time I'm going to be tasting the rosés from the kit. Greg, where are you uh, zooming in from, buddy? Tonight I am in Las Vegas, but Saturday I will be in New York City seeing uh, the Foo Fighters. All right. Yeah. Greg is our uh, representative for our charity, and um, we used to work with TJ Martel. Now we're sending the funds to uh, Children's Hospital Los Angeles through, what's, uh, what's our charity, 501c3? It's called Unite the United. So yeah, so all the money goes to Unite the United, and then we write a nice check to Children's Hospital at the end of the year after you know all these great tastings that we do. And uh, the Unite the United group is uh, a lot of the, the music industry is behind T.J. Martell, but they're also behind Unite the United, a lot of the same people we are working with, and T.J. Martell shut down during COVID because uh, they were a live event uh, charity, and, uh, they had to go away. So, yes, they, they haven't pivoted as well as uh, as you have. Well, we 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 stayed busy. Um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's certainly uh, where we find ourselves. But we're super thrilled with tonight's uh, tasting. I have tasted through these wines on a number of occasions. So, let's get started. Um, did everybody get a copy of our brochure tonight, uh, and also the tasting mat? All right. Cool. So um, we're here to uh, we we want you to ask questions of the producers. Uh, if you if you love what you're tasting or you have a question, uh, we love the chat box down below on the bottom of the screen. It says chat, chat it up. Well, you can start talking about whatever comes to mind too. We love people to get a little snarky on the chat box, and we'd love to uh, um, also um, Greg, if you wouldn't mind just pasting in the chat box the auction, because we've got some interesting auction items this time, right? Yeah, um, w you know, for the wine, we actually bundled uh, two really great cases together. And I know you threw in a bottle of Beekeeper there, so thank you for that. And then, uh, you know, now that things are starting to open up, we've got some great trips. Um, we've got some great stuff that we're doing virtually, you know, some, uh, some bartending classes, uh, we've also got that bottle right there, that three liter. Yeah. Yeah, so there's great stuff there, not just wine. So give it all a look, even if it's not for yourself, you know, there's always a holiday or birthday coming up. You know, it's always great to pick it up for somebody else, maybe an assistant. So give it a look. We're running the auction till Sunday night at 9 p.m. Yeah, because we do this event two nights, tonight and Saturday. Um, there are just a couple more tasting kits available for Saturday night, but uh, I think I can't remember who I was talking with about our scheduling. But you know, Saturdays have become pretty uh, challenging for us, so we're moving our zooms to Wednesday and Thursday, starting in July, and uh, that's how we're going to uh, keep our Zoom into Wine programs uh, going. And then we'll do some live events on the weekends. Uh, it'll take a while for the live event thing to return for us, but uh, it's certainly something we are uh, interested in maintaining and, and bringing back when, when the time is right. But uh, we'll, we'll continue to provide great Zoom content on Wednesdays and Thursdays starting in July. All right, so uh, yes, uh, Larry Schaefer, you, you can always uh, have the right to be the first and the most snarky. Um, I appreciate that. Get in there. Larry's up in Santa Barbara. Um, we've got a really awesome show. Larry, you're going to go second tonight. Uh, we're going to start down in New Zealand. And so let's get our first wine, the Forest. 
Uh, this is from Marlboro, New Zealand. Well, let's welcome David Harlow. Hey, David, are you out there? I'm here. How's everybody doing? I like the way that Ian invited everybody to be as snarky as possible. So, yes, yes, just feel free. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll just do uh, one quick favor for all of the other uh, wine uh, reps who are on the phone or wine people who are on the phone um, or Zoom. And that is, uh, if you just poured the forest in your glass, uh, you just took it out of the refrigerator, um, put your hand under the glass and warm it up a little bit because um, there's just about nothing worse than a cold, cold, cold rosé that you're just going to get more acidity and not the, you're not going to taste any fruit. So something that's kind of a little, just take the chill off it a little bit. And then you get that nice mix of fruit and acidity. And that's when, when your rosé tastes amazing. Very, very nice. All right. Yeah. So just to make sure everybody saw it, uh, if this is our brochure with our notes on there, but the, I want to make sh doubly sure, you know, that what we put on the brochure is the price kind of like the target price for a lot of these wines. And if you click on your digital brochure through, you're going to go to the website tonight and see really, really aggressive pricing just for this week. Plus, if you use the codes that you see on the brochure, you're going to save 5% uh, more on six bottles and 10% more on 12. So, and the 12 bottle, assort, it could be assorted. Any 12 bottles will save you 10%. So make sure you take advantage of that pricing discount. We wanna send out a lot of rosé for these producers. And um, uh, we, we're excited to have you there. We are live on Facebook tonight too. So uh, if you wanna revisit this, you can go to Zoom Into Wine and see our, our video on the Zoom Into Wine page uh, for forever. All right, so David, let's get started. You're gonna be number one of seven. We're gonna go in this order. Uh, Forest, then Tesaro, then Casa Revelis. Uh, Mr. Byron Blady uh, will do uh, Bertani, the Up brand, and then Domain Ott. Here's our tasting mat for those of you that didn't print one. Um, that gives you a little uh, tasting order for you because we didn't put numbers on the jars because I frankly didn't get to taste these in order until like Monday. So um, we didn't put numbers on the jars not knowing which order to put them in. I hope you uh, enjoy the order I put them in. Um, but uh, basically kind of uh, d rewarded uh, more fruit in the forward part of the tasting and more acidity at the end. So let's uh, get started with David and uh, see how it goes, buddy. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So um, hopefully you guys all have that in your glass right now. Uh, and I'll just tell you real quick up front, if you're going to start uh, sipping away, um, you're sipping on 80% Pinot Noir and 20% Malbec. Uh, Malbec, not a very common grape for, for New Zealand, but uh, but Dr. Forrest uh, is just a guy who loves to experiment and loves to play with different grapes and he makes some very beautiful wines. So uh, so as a, uh, I, I, I always hate, I don't want people to wait to drink. So I recommend you go ahead and take a sip and- well, Let's toast, let's toast everybody. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. To the reopening. <laughs> yes, especially in California the Dodgers mm -hmm. oh, my Dodgers yes <laughs> so uh, so this wine comes from Marlboro Marlboro is about 75% of all the wine in New Zealand comes from Marlboro and you guys probably know that the most famous wine from New Zealand is actually a Sauvignon Blanc not a rosé but Marlboro is just a very very beautiful fertile fertile valley kind of if you think about napa valley you know way way back that's kind of has some little bit of reminiscence of that and grows a beautiful sauvignon blanc but it also grows a lot of other grapes um, great pinots come from there um, great rosés come from there and even some good chardonnays from the different valleys that are there so um so yeah real quick background on uh next slide ian if you could sure um, so this is the Forest Winery in Marlboro. It's actually part of a, it's, it's part, it's one of 24 wineries that are on a bike trail. 
So there's actually a really great, if you've ever been to New Zealand or if you want to go to New Zealand, Marlborough's on the very tip of the North Island. Sorry, very tip of the, the very Northern tip of the South Island. Uh, and it is a actual, yeah, it's a, so I, I guess I can't really point, but I don't know if you can see, can you see my arrow or not? So, no. okay. Where do you want so, to point? Well, I, you can see on the, on the right side of the map where the red, the red is, that's Marlborough. Yeah. And then if you could see to the, to the northeast of that, the big white blotch, that's, uh, that's the North Island of New Zealand. So you can see it's pretty close there at the bottom. And uh, it, again, a very beautiful place to visit. So I just would highly recommend, I think they're gonna open up again in January. So uh, I know that people are already making reservations and plans to go. Uh, January, of course, is their, the middle of their summer. So it's a good, it's actually a good time to escape our winter if you're in that kind of a place. But it is uh, quite lovely and the wines are lovely. Uh, Forest makes some great wines. There's Dr. John Forrest and his daughter, Beth, who is actually the winemaker. And they started, uh, he started back in the 80s making wine in New Zealand. He and his wife were both doctors. Uh, his wife was a physician and he was a, um, a, a physiologist. And they both decided that they wanted to open a winery, went back to New Zealand and that's what they did. So. Uh, and Beth, when she got old enough, she went to uh, enology school, learned her trade, and came back to be the winemaker at Forest. So she's adding a little bit of youthfulness to the to the team. Um, if you could go, yeah, next slide. This is a little quick video on the Forest Winery. So I figured I'd let you guys see that. They move very quickly down there. <laughs> it looks like it's on speed play. <laughs> And he's walking backwards. Yeah, there's some cheesy music, which is not playing, but that's okay. You don't really need the music, but you can kind of just see how beautiful it is. It's, uh, and if you saw in the beginning, a lot of people with their bikes kind of riding in. It's nice when you don't have to ride your bike on, uh, on, the, tr on the roads with the drunk drivers. Oh, for sure. Let me go to slide number eight here, bud. Yeah, so and this is just kind of an overview of the winery. And again, you see this big, beautiful, fertile valley, grapes as far as the eye can see. Uh, and uh, okay, so what do you guys think about the wine? Anybody yeah. have any comments? There's a, one more shot for you too. Okay. Uh, it's another visual. And let me tell you that one of the cool things about this place, first of all, it's like pristine, beautiful, clean. They, uh, uh, when I visited New Zealand, it's one of the more expensive places to visit, by the way. So uh, uh, they, they have a tax for everything down there, David. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's also just pristine, clean, and, and uh, really about preservation of the ecosystem. And this place is really drilling cold at night, even in this warm summer day. And that's why the grapes respond the way they do. And... Um, I, I like uh, I like the, the comment that you made when we started about bringing this up to temperature because this this thing takes on a little bit more weight and richness yeah. as it warms up and I love this wine with food especially something like uh, red flesh fish sh sushi uh, uh, salmon grilled chicken uh, this is really uh, a, a a wonderful wine to, to take to many different occasions and quite honestly any rosé kind of does that but in particular this one because of the pinot nature of this wine yeah. and uh, that pinot set and, and you close your eyes and smell pinot noir and you can feel that 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 added layer of richness what do you guys think let me bring everybody into view and uh, we can all yeah, and, the, and the best part of any rosé look all the rosés are beautiful that you guys are going to taste tonight so that's the that's a beautiful thing but the the most beautiful part of any rosé is that balance between fruit and acidity so that you get a you get that you know i'll, I'll just call it yummy you know yummy good fruit in the beginning but then it's balanced by that acid so it's not too sweet or overly fruity so it's still refreshing Wendy Caldwell, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm really enjoying this. Thank you. Good. Did you have good. to work today? Do you go, are you now going back to your office? I am. Uh, it was a nice little Saturday is what we call it. Yeah. I, I know that the, 
a month from now, we're all going to get over the part of, oh, this is kind of awkward taking our masks off. And we're, pretty soon we're all going to be talking about, oh, I, I'm missing not being able to stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But uh, I'm, Terry Kamali, I see you got a nice little group there. Hope you guys are having fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Melvin J. Hi, Jan Corbo. Good to see you, Therese Mackey. Thank you so much. Josh Boxer, thank you guys. How are you? What's the dog's name? This is Snoopy, and she's a big fan of virtual wine tastings. So uh, awesome. she's a veteran. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, we love we love the dogs and the cats. So if you guys have them, bring them on. All right, David. Good job. Um, we're very happy to have you as our first wine tonight. It really kicks it off. And if you can feel that, uh, that kind of that mouthfeel, just, I mean, isn't your mouth now salivating? It's kind of exciting your palate and making you hungry. Uh, if you want to eat on the zoom, you're welcome to do that too. We say, bring your apps, bring your food, get in people's face, show off your food. If you've got good food, by the way. Yeah. I'll try and answer some of the chats, by the way. I see you guys asking some questions and I'll try and answer them in the chat so you guys can move on. I don't wanna hold you up. Thank you so much, we appreciate it. And if uh, you're welcome to uh, bring up anything throughout the night uh, on any, uh, any of the producers, if you're gonna hang on with us, but uh, we thank you for being here, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Larry. <clears throat> I have to unmute myself. Sorry about that, Ian. It's been such a long time. I know it's been at least four hours. Maybe, maybe not even that. Well, um, I didn't. I didn't get the joke about who's your doppelganger. Who do people say you look like? <sighs> Massimo Batura. Yeah, do, doesn't he look like Massimo Batura? Come on. Yeah, you have to look it up. It's kind of scared me when I saw him for the first time. So the Italian, the Italian chef. Uh, he's. Uh, he's. Uh, this is. I this see is, that. This I hope he it. can cook like him. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I did have some blue cheese bread in here earlier today, so uh, when you I, visit I, when you visit Larry's tasting room, if he doesn't have bread, he bakes bread every freaking day, and people now have the bread expectation, and he is one hell of a baker. So definitely go up and and visit Larry's tasting room in Santa Barbara. You're right in uh, Los Olivos, right, Larry? Yeah, well, well, time out. First of all, I don't break bread every bake bread. I break bread every day, but I don't bake bread every day. So um, and I was building you up. And yeah, and the, and the reason I say that is I literally have people come into my taste room. They're like, you know, your wine's pretty good, but that's the best effing bread I've ever had. And I'm like, well, <laughs> uh, I'm not a baker, so thank you. But um, how about we try my wine? I think that yeah, let's get there. Let's get there. Um, yeah. So a uh, little background on myself, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Larry Schaefer. So I have a taste room here in downtown Los Libas. That's where I'm sitting in, in right now. I've been making wine in this area for about 15 years. Uh, I didn't start off in the wine business. I actually uh, attended uh, undergraduate at UC Davis is where I started, but I wasn't interested in wine. I ended up transferring to Berkeley, graduated from uh, UC Berkeley's uh, Haas School of Business. And my first job out of school was in the music industry in Burbank. Uh, I love music. In high school, I took pictures for a punk band in the uh, uh, in the South Bay, and so I was in Hollywood every weekend going to clubs. And I started working for this record company, and I was in the finance department. And I'm a I'm a numbers guy, but I'm much more of a person, people person. So after a couple of years, it was time to move on um, because I was stuck kind of doing numbers, and I ended up getting into publishing, educational publishing, and trade publishing. About 20 years ago, I uh, about 20 years ago, I decided to kind of switch things up. Life was not very exciting for me. I didn't feel like I was being challenged, and science always scared the heck out of me. So I started going back to school. I was living in Orange County, took classes at junior colleges with kids who could have been my kids, taking chemistry and biology and all the stuff I promised myself I would never take. Um, ended up transferring back to UC Davis and got my master's degree in viticulture and enology. Uh, and I graduated in 05, moved up to where I'm at now. I worked on the winemaking team at Fess Parker for uh, nearly a decade and then branched off to start my own brand. Um, I concentrate on Rhone varieties. For those of you who don't know, there's an organization called the Rhone Rangers. It's a national organization that's kind of meant to help educate people about other uh, varieties 
uh, other varieties that are out there. Um, and are people having problems hearing me talk? No, I th I'm not. Sh I don't think so. Uh, we had okay. one person say their audio went out, but I, 42 other people said no. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm on the National Board of Directors of the Rhone Rangers. I am president of the Santa Barbara County Chapter. So these are really the varieties I dig working with. Um, that said, I, I am a curious person as well. So I'm, I made my first Pinot Noir in 2020, made my first Cab Franc as well. So I do some other stuff, but mainly concentrate on Rhone varieties. Um, and so the wine we're gonna try tonight is my Morvedra Rosé. So the picture you see right now is uh, the Morvedra that I picked from Camp 4 Vineyard in Eastern San Ginez. So the grapes come in and that bin is about a four foot by four foot by three foot high plastic bin. I do not sort my fruit. The fruit comes in like that. I take my shoes and socks off and I jump in and I foot stomp these grapes for anywhere between five and 10 minutes per each of these bins. Um, I then let the juice sit on those, uh, sit with the skins for about an hour. And then I dump it into the press. From there, it presses, it goes into a chilled tank. It settles for about two days because when you press juice, there's still a lot of solids that come in. And then I go ahead and uh, let it settle. And after two days, I take the juice off of the solids, put it into another tank and ferment this really cold to hold on to some very specific aromatic profiles. Uh, and then after it is done fermenting, uh, it is transferred to another tank and to older French oak barrels where it sees just a very, very small uh, amount of time. Uh, this was bottled the second week of February. It was bottled very, very early. I wanted to capture kind of the, the brightness of this wine and I'm really happy about where it's at. Um, more Vedra Rosés perennially take longer to kind of open up and develop. And I would say that this wine is still in its kind of teenager stage it will drink best uh, six to 18 months down the line but it certainly is drinking well now and I, I love the aromatics of this one as well um, so it's a pretty simple wine to make uh, people oftentimes ask me what the most difficult wine to make is and my answer almost always is rosé and people are surprised by that but there's very little winemakers do from the moment the grapes come in until that goes into a bottle as opposed to having something stay in oak for 12, 18, 24 months and blending, etc. Rosés are pretty much there. You either like it or you don't. Um, I would agree with the, the first speaker. This is not a rosé to drink really, really cold. Um, I think as we get going, there's going to be rosés that are going to have maybe more acid. And I think when you have a rosé that has more acid and you want to accentuate that crispness, you want to serve it cold. This rosé has very good texture um, and great aromatics. And so the closer it is to kind of cellar temperature, the more that is shown off. And so that's why I tend to prefer to pour it at say 55, 60 degrees. Um, and I and I really like it at that temperature. This is very much a food rosé. I've done winemaker dinners where this has been paired with bouillabaisse. It's been paired with chiapino. It's been paired with a goat cheese salad. It's been paired with roasted chicken. Um, it really does well with all of those. Um, and this is one of two rosés I make. You can see behind me, um, there's actually two rosés. The one over here that I'm pointing at is my Morvedra. The one over here is actually another rosé that I make called uh, the variety is Senso. Um, and I, I really take rosé seriously. So the picture you're looking at now is settling. So basically after this is done fermenting, it still is cloudy. I go ahead and put it into uh, a sample bottle and I let it settle out. So you can see the picture on the right um, under Betty White, uh, my favorite, not my favorite, but a very favorite actress of mine. Um, the one on the left, uh, is uh, is Senso Rosé and the one on the right, and I'm talking about the picture on the right, is the Morvedra Rosé. And then you'll see as it settles out, as all those solids fall to the bottom, you'll see the, the actual color of the wine. And that is one of the interesting things about Rosé is you really don't know what color you have until after it's finished fermenting, after it's settled out, um, because you really have no clear indication of that until the very end. Huh. Do you ever add uh, red wine to en enhance the color? You know, I, I have never done that. I know other winemakers that do that. I was gonna talk about that in the first uh, seminar that, you know, there are winemakers that add white wine to decrease color. And there are winemakers that add red wine. You know, there's an adage that we eat with our eyes, but we also drink with our eyes. And the color of rosé has become more and more and more important. Um, there's a, in Provence, there's an institute that's kind of looked at this and over the last decade, the, the decrease in color is about 100 or about 50% from where it was uh, 10 years ago, then people's impression is the darker the rosé, the sweeter it's going to be. 
And so there's a push to get lighter and lighter and lighter rosés. Um, I never worry about the color. I mean, if you look at that Senso Rosé, you'll see I don't worry because it's incredibly light. Uh, I know another wine winemaker that does this Senso Rosé and he actually does blend in red Senso at the end to give it more color, to kind of hit a specific color pattern, uh, which is not, again, it's not what I'm after. The color is what the color is. Very good. Well, your wine has uh, like electricity in the nose. I can, it's so um, beautiful and, and detailed and floral and citrus and perfumed. Um, and it's really, really got a, a, a sizzling nose. Uh, anyone have any questions for Larry about the Tessero Morved Rosé? Yeah, it's opening up nicely as it um, gets a little less cool. Mm -hmm. as, as, as you would expect with any any white or rosé wine, for sure. And your, wine, your wine will age really well too, right, buddy? Yeah, there's a, a, a there's a, a, a thread in the chat about rosés, and I think that there is an adage that you you drink rosés about the same period that you wear white shoes. Was that Memorial Day to Labor Day? Is that the uh, the general uh, time you're supposed to do that. I think it really depends upon the rosé. I think rosés that are acid-driven tend to be a little shorter-lived. I think rosés that are texturally driven tend to be able to last longer and age longer. Um, I look at this rosé as almost like a light red wine, even though it doesn't have the color of a light red wine, a Cinso or a, or a, you know, or a light Pinot, uh, but it has the body of that. And what's amazing is that's only after an hour of being on the skins. Um, which is really cool. Uh, so yes, there is a Davis connection. So Tercero, the brand, um, it uh, means third in Spanish. I'm a third child, I have three kids, but I also attended UC Davis as an undergrad and lived in the Tercero dorms. So it does have that. Um, these are shot Zweisel glasses, not, um, not Zaltos. Can't afford the Zaltos. I'm, not, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a winemaker, not a brewer, so. <laughs> good, good. Any questions for our regional expert, Larry Schaefer. Well, he'll be on the chat there and Larry's got all the wines tonight. So uh, you can taste along with us and and um, Larry, please do ask questions. You always have some wonderful input and uh, we, we thank you for that. We're gonna move into wine number three and we're gonna go to Portugal. And our um, Casa Reblas is represented by Alexandra Rebles. Hello, good evening. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm looking for you on my screen. Let me find you first. Keep talking. So say, tell me where you're at tonight. I'm uh, I'm in, in a Portuguese go. island called Madeira. All so, right. And my name is Alexandre. And uh, together with my brother, we run this uh, this family farming business uh, located on the south of Portugal, in Alentejo, uh, which is uh, one of the most important uh, wine producing regions in Portugal. Casa Relvas, it's a little bit more than wine. It's, uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of pork forest as well surrounding the vineyards, as well as uh, olive groves. So we are a, a company that produce a, a lot of different uh, farming uh, things. Very nice. Well, we have, we've uh, never had anyone uh, zoom in from uh, the island of Madeira before. So that's really an amazing thing. So uh, that's why I love this Zoom product, because we can have you from Santa Barbara to France, all in the same place. It's really, really awesome. So thank you for joining us. And I have a PowerPoint presentation. Have you been able to see your PowerPoint, Alexandra? Yeah, I saw it before, yeah. Okay, good. And uh, I'll just show people a little map of uh, the Alentagio. Oh, you're in Alentagio, is that what you said? Uh, our, our vineyard is in Alentagio. So Portugal, sometimes when the, the map is not on the side of Spain, is not e easier to, to recognize, but Alentejo is that um, brown region that goes from the sea to the border in Spain. 
it's an area which is around 30% of Portuguese area. Right. It's an area which is very interesting to, to work the vineyards because we, we go through the sea level to the mountain. So from zero meters of altitude to 1000 meters. And we have a, a big diversity of soils. Something we have all over the region, it's the sun. The sun shines around 3000 hours per year on, on this region. So it makes that it's quite hard. It's quite easy to to have the fruits ripe. So in all the wines from Alentejo, from whites to reds to roses to reservas, one of the most important things for us to preserve is the, the fruit component and the, the purity of the, the, the aromatics. This rosé we're tasting today, it comes from Herdade São Miguel. Uh, Herdade São Miguel, it's our main vineyard, our if you want our most qualitative vineyard. It's um, a vineyard which is located on the foothill of a mountain with the quite poor soils of uh, schist, the rock. And which means that by one hand we'll have the sun that will make as the, the, the grapes become very nice uh, with a very nice ripeness. But the other hand we have the soil uh, which uh, is very, very rocky and the vineyards, the vines to get alive, they should uh, have the roots very deep. So it will give us a lot of minerality and a lot of freshness to our wines, which is very important coming from a warm region. So this rosé is made out of uh, two very important grapes in Alentejo. Uh, Turiga Nacional and Aragonés blended with a little bit of uh, Shiraz. It's made from the first juices uh, in order to have the, the, the most pure aromas and uh, also fermented with cold temperature and then it stays a little bit in contact uh, with the lees. It's, uh, I think it's very interesting what the, the two producers before told uh, on their presentation concerning the temperature of the rosé. Uh, we tend to drink the roses very, very in, in temperatures where we, we cannot feel the wines. And it's important to have the wine in a balanced uh, temperature in order to uh, feel the, the aromas and the feelings. Uh, sometimes when the roses are, are, very, are quite sweet, it's easier to drink very cold, but those ga more gastronomic roses, it's interesting to have it a little bit up in temperature to profit all the qualities of those wines. Well, it's showing really, really nice. And uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in one, one thing. What time is it there? 3 3:30 3 in the morning. Jeepers creepers. So sorry to wake you up so early or or did you stay up all night? No, no, I am going to sleep after after this. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh that's uh, quite late and uh so uh we're showing the video of your of your property. How many total hectares is this? Uh, Herdade São Miguel it's 35 hectares. Uh, in total, Casa Ravas, we manage around 350 hectares of vineyards. Wow. Great. This is a, 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 a movie that I, I don't know if it's going to be shared after about our sustainability program. Uh, we are quite on front in, in Portugal in terms of sustainability. Uh, as we are a, a, a farming company with very different areas, we need to be in front of that to, to make the things easier for the next generations. Well, we will... I saw uh, here... Say again, sorry. No, please go ahead. I saw here a question concerning the, the, the corks, if we produce our own corks. 
uh, we don't. Uh, we produce cork as a raw material, and then the, um, we harvest the cork, but then we sell the cork to a, a cork factory that uh, that transform the 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 cork in raw material into cork, which is a a quite long uh, road. Excellent. And um, right now we are tasting the 2020. And how are things going moving along for Portugal? Because I know a lot of Europe got hit really hard with frost. Are you guys okay? We are okay. We are okay. Uh, we in Alentejo on the north of Portugal, we had a little bit of uh, frost in April and some grail last week, so things are not very easy. Uh, in Alentejo, until now, everything is okay, and I hope it will be... We need a, a good harvest. The, the harvest last vintage was not fantastic in quality. We are not going to launch our top wines. It's a very nice uh, quality for mid-range wines, very fruity wines, but that little star was missing. So we hope we can, we'll have a, a 2021 harvest with lots of quality and lot of aging potential. Well, thank you. We've got just about uh, 30 seconds on the video. We're looking at the entire sustainable um, chain that you guys have industrialized here how many total uh, cases are you producing we produce seven million bottles per year in cases seven million divided by 12. <laughs> exactly <laughs> a little less than uh, maybe uh, probably about six around half a million bottles uh, half a million cases per year yeah and um you know, this is this wine sells at an incredible price. Uh, we get a great value proposition out of Portugal here in America. And um, so if, if you like this wine, check out the price on the website um, because it is a, a, a really good value and a beautiful wine. I think we just have another slide or two from you. And uh, this this is a, a little bit more detail about your core holdings. Yeah, about about Cork, in terms of land at Casa Relvas, Cork is the main activity. It's around 750 hectares of Cork. So we focus a lot on the Cork. Cork, it's a, I don't know if you you know, but it's one of the only forest business where you don't need to cut the trees uh, to work. So it means that it's a very, very sustainable way of cultivating the land. Yeah, you just take the cork and then it uh, regenerates. Exactly. And I've seen a lot of urns on the property. Are these uh, urns that you currently use or are they from the history? Those we are not using anymore, but we have uh, a small uh, winery, only with amphoras. Uh, where we make some white and uh, and uh, red wine like the, the Romans they used to, to do so with very very long uh, skin contact time and with very low intervention is there a lot of historical uh, this is the, the that small winery yes and how much hit I mean how long ago were people making wine in Alentagio so the, the, the wine arrived in Alentejo with the Romans, so 3,000 years ago. Uh, and, and then it was banished during around 500 years because Alentejo was occupied by the, the Muslims. So, and then when Alentejo becomes Portugal again, uh, the wine, uh, had, we had begun doing wine again. Right. Uh, the Enforage, it's still very present in our, in our winemaking process. 
it's mostly wine drunk on the region but there's a few companies like us that uh, that are now bottling that wine and selling the wrong yeah we're seeing uh those urns return and all over the world if we can only find people that know how to make them yeah, they made them hundreds of years ago <laughs> and the technology and the expertise in making those urns is kind of disappeared with that population but uh it's uh it is definitely a new craft and uh urns you know you might think that maybe they're saving money with urns but they're actually quite expensive yeah it's uh i think it's a uh, it's a little bit a trend uh, yeah. everywhere and with those uh, novel vague of uh, natural wines and everything people are using that a lot i think it's very interesting uh, to use but uh, I, I think what's happening in portugal and also in georgia for example it's uh, there's not only the amphora who make the process it's also the way of making the process for example, the white wine, typical white wine in Alentejo, made in Alfora, it's a white wine with three months of skin contact, which means that we'll have a completely different wine uh, than the, the, the kind of wine of white wine we used to. It's the, what we call sometimes orange wine, but uh, with a nice structure. Those used to be wines that it used to be drunk like even with meat and everything sure well i want to thank you for joining us at 3 30 in the morning in portugal i'm going to drink a case of this wine just because you you made the zoom so cheers to you oh. and thank you for being up so late and uh, teaching us about your wine and buona notte thank you buona noite. you think my french and my italian's bad try my portuguese that is that is some tough stuff. Have you ever seen? Uh, have you ever been in a room with a Portuguese having a nice conversation? It is uh, it is one of the reasons why I can't move to Portugal because there's absolutely no hope for me who uh, struggles with English learning uh, Portuguese. All right, uh, let's uh, let's welcome our fourth wine, Byron Blatty. What's up, Ian? How are you, buddy? Mark Blatty is on the Zoom with us. I was just, uh, it didn't take a calculator to realize that uh, those guys who just went before us make 100,000 more, 100,000 times more wine than we do. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, <clears throat> these guys are uh, trying, they, you know, they make a wine that they have to uh, export all over the world because it's, um, you know, in the Portuguese currency, it would be a very hard business to make a, thousand cases of wine and make a living yeah so they do they i think he said five hundred thousand cases and we're 600 right, probably six we're right now averaging 500 cases not of our rosé of our entire portfolio so <laughs> That's we're, great. we're uh we're a lot smaller but um, oh, we, we love having you as the artists on on the zoom to make it real and uh for those of you that have not met Mark Blatty before Byron Blatty, um, really a hardworking guy here in Southern California. Not, not as hardworking as Larry Shaver. I did see that in the Zoom. I was wondering if you guys were throwing that back and forth, but you both bust your ass. And uh, <laughs> so Mark, let's taste your wine. We're running a little bit behind, so I, I need you to help me. Yeah, no worries. We'll, we'll, jam, we'll jam through it. So uh, if, if you guys want to just enjoy the wine, get dig right into it if you haven't already. Um, I want to just say thanks for including us, Ian, in the lineup and everybody for giving us a shot here, you know, looking at the lineup, we've got Portugal, we've got Italy, Santa Barbara, you know, two rosés from Provence in the lineup, uh, Portugal, you know, New Zealand, and uh, the lowly Los Angeles. So I'm proud to represent the least important uh, wine region in the lineup tonight. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'll just tell you guys a little bit about what we do and we can kind of clip through these slides. Um, Jenny, my wife Jenny and I uh, created Byron Blatty Wines uh, in 2014. That was our first vintage. Uh, our backgrounds both were television production. So no background in wine professionally, 
uh, apart from drinking it, uh, just started to drink it, love it, learn about it. Uh, and as you know, probably everybody on this Zoom has found themselves wanting to learn more and more and more about wine. Well, eventually, Ian can attest to this, you'll get to the place maybe where that sickness turns into an idea that you're going to start your own winery. Um, that's when you start to, you need to start taking the medication at that point. Yeah, that's when it gets really out of hand. Um, but we, we had this idea um, that we wanted to start our own brand. Um, and we were really inspired by the history of the Napa Valley vintners initially and how they, you know, everybody thought they were crazy to, to make wine from California that was absurd. It could never compete with the French. And lo and behold, you know, Napa Valley is obviously one of the premier wine regions in the world. And in learning about the history of Napa Valley vintners, there kept being these little footnotes in the history of California wine that were mentioning Los Angeles. And, you know, I like to show this slide of LA because when we tell people we make wines from LA, they always go, wait, you can't where it's too hot or where is it by growing by the freeway or you know there's sort of we don't have this mental image of the los angeles wine region but i, I like this slide because it it reminds us how diverse the climate actually is in la county we've got the beaches we've got the mountains we've got snow we've got desert we have canyons it's it's and it's a massive county um but what a lot of people don't realize is los angeles was actually the birthplace of california wine before northern california was even a thing and that's a whole other thing for another time. But if you look that up, you, you can find out some info about it. Um, but uh, our, our primary focus on our wines is kind of big new world style fruit driven reds. Um, and we, we, you know, we like to think that they're big kind of serious wines. Um, and so, but for our rosé, it's sort of a shift in style for us, I think. If you're familiar with our reds, I think you probably expect our rosé to be a really big sort of brooding uh, wine, and it's not. And that's because our rosé is actually inspired by the wines of Provence, which are going to come up next in the lineup, which which I think is really should be interesting to see how, how well we did with that. And I think anybody here who's got their own winery, people will tell you, you have to make wines that you'd like to drink um to keep it real and also because if you can't sell it you're going to be the one drinking it all so you might as well like it um so jenny and i when we're drinking wine at home we're in southern california it's hot we often reach for these old world uh rosés that are still have plenty of fruit but are a little leaner a little more acid driven and a little lighter on their feet perhaps um so that's what this wine is inspired by um uh, this is a map of LA County. Uh, the vineyard, this this wine is 97% uh, Grenache, actually comes from that little vineyard in the top left corner out in the Antelope Valley, the high desert, uh, called the Swayze Family Vineyard. No relation to Patrick Swayze, sadly. Um, the next few slides in are just a couple pictures of the vineyards, uh, uh, particularly the, the one in the Antelope Valley. It's out near the Poppy Preserve. Um, this is what it looks like in spring. Right now, it looks like the Sahara Desert out there is so hot and so dry, but we find that the Rhone varietals do pretty well out there, better than you would expect. Um, sometimes when I show these slides of the poppies and given the kind of paler color of our rosé, I do occasionally get an awkward question where people say, oh, is it the poppies that make the wine that color? And I found saying no makes people feel bad, so I usually just say yes at this point. <laughs> Um, but speaking of color, there's those poppies, they're gorgeous. Larry um, brought up something about the color of rosé, and I think one interesting thing about rosé is you'll, you'll, most of the time when you're making red wines, I feel like the fruit in the vineyard is going to drive, be in the driver's seat, and you're trying to make the best version of what that vineyard's going to give you in a red, in, in your own style, but rosé is a, is a, is a pure stylistic choice. So anytime you're drinking someone's rosé, they've made it that way with intention. Um, you know, you, you, it's it's may not be the hardest wine, but it's very technical. You have to make a lot of decisions about how it's going to come out, I think. Um, so our rosé in the Antelope Valley, the Grenache gets ripe in this really, 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 really short window of time. And we don't want it to get too much color 
and we don't want it to really get too ripe actually. So when we uh, harvest the wine and press it, after it's done fermenting, our rosé is pretty much looks like white wine. Um, it smells like it does, um, but it looks like a, like a, it almost looks like an orange wine. It's like a pale uh, white wine with a yellow tinge and it's not very attractive. Um, so we do blend in 3% of Syrah as a red wine. Um, and we use the Syrah, I think it adds a little bit of complexity, but really I think it's, it's, uh, it's the color. It really puts that sort of rose goldy color on it. And then as a result, we control how much Syrah goes in. So we control the, uh, the hue. Um, and being inspired by those wines from Southern France and Provence that we kind of like that light, pale, kind of fresh color. Um, and then the Syrah that, that we are showing that little 3%, it actually comes from a little hillside vineyard in the Malibu coast. So we get fruit from basically all over LA County and mainly in our Reds program, they're big blends. Um, just wanted to throw this one out there in case you guys are uh, wine, uh, wine enthusiast magazine fans. This is the current California issue of Wine Enthusiast, and they just did a big, huge feature on Los Angeles wine. So if you find that you like the wine uh, and you're interested in finding out more about LA wine, this article would be a great place to start. So that's so cool. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Well, you do a great job on not only your wine, but your packaging. You're representing LA very well, my friend. You are LA. Thanks, buddy. I love it. And uh, we want to thank you for joining our, our STARS event. And Cheers. Uh, uh, now, uh, both yours and Larry's wines, uh, because you're smaller producers and you're here in Southern California, we're encouraging everybody to go and visit their stores and buy the wine directly from them. And uh, Larry, if they buy the wine from you, can they keep it with you until they make it to your tasting room, or do they? Do you need to ship it? Uh, no, they can certainly uh, pick it up whenever they like, or I'll hold off shipping. Uh, I also posted that I, I use the code Stars, and you'll get a twenty percent discount on any of the wines, not only my rosé, but any of the wines on my website uh, up until Saturday night. Bam. Well, uh, thank you very much for that. And, and, and do uh, make sure you make a trip up to see Larry's tasting room and ask him about his bread and apparently his cookies. Yeah, yeah there you didn't go. Know the, didn't know about the cookies. Bourbon cookies. Oh, bourbon cookies. All right. And then, Mark? yeah, we're going to throw um, uh, a little promo code up there as well for, for a discount on our wines. And we do for you guys here in LA, we do local local delivery. So uh, you can grab any of the wines on our site, including our rosé, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, cool. And what's that discount code you're gonna- put Yeah, I'll put that in the chat. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward. It's 20 off. There you go, 20 off. Yeah. Bam. Well, very, very creative, Mark, very creative. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, um, and and do look out for Mark and, and Larry as they uh, traverse the Southern California marketplace and do special events and tastings and stuff. And, and that both of them have been supportive of, of Learn About Wine for many years. So we thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. All right. Well, I hope you guys are feeling a little better. Your Wednesday was off to uh, a, a rock and start going back to work some of you for the first time some of you walked into a store without a mask on for the first time and then got yelled at today for not wearing a mask did that happen to anybody uh well maybe not um i did that on accident i forgot my mask so but um, I, I want to thank you guys for being here. And uh, if you guys have any questions or comments, so the chat, chat is actually quite active, and I love that. So uh, check that out if you want to say anything to any of the producers. They're, they're responding. And, um, and do keep in touch with these guys. Well, we're moving on to wine number five, and we're going to Italy. And I know that our Italian ambassador which was going to be Michael Young, had a little family thing pop flare up. So we have a substitute from Bertani. Who's handling Bertani tonight? Is that you, Mr. Heim? Draheim? Hello, everybody. Hello. How are you? I am doing very well. Uh, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Cool. Well, thanks for watching our show. 
Of course. Um, I'm actually joining you guys from Napa. I live in, in Old Town, Napa. Um, I work up here to represent this book, um, Taub Family Selections Portfolio, which Bertani is one of our iconic producers. And so really excited to tell you a little bit about this, Berta Rosé. Now, some of you might recognize the name Bertani because it's a, a really famous house in Northern Italy. Uh, specialist in Amaroni Valpolicella. And um, when I, Michael's my friend and Michael and, and I have done a lot of Zooms together. And I asked him, I said, what kind of rosés do you guys represent? And we went down a list of potential candidates and I was like, hmm, hmm, hmm. Bertani makes a rosé? And I said it like that and then I tasted it and uh, definitely a really cool way to show rosé in an italian fashion so thank you for being here to help us out yeah uh, of course we have a really um cool video that incorporates some of these slides with uh, the owner of bertani would you mind if i get into that one no go for it okay here we go the man himself let me see if we can get this louder what area, what part of Italy are we talking to you from? Uh, we are located in Verona. Verona, let's say, is uh, uh, 100 miles inland from Venice and less than uh, 70 miles uh, east side from me. This is Andrea Lenardi, right? Is that his SRI? Correct. Yes. And he is the owner of Bertani. Yeah. So we are just uh, next to the Garda Lake, the largest uh, lake in the north part of Italy. Uh, very let's say the second largest with like Como Lake. Uh, and uh, we are very close to the heart. So it's a very, it's a mix of Mediterranean weather during the most during the winter time, where the actually the lake can really influence uh, the climate and the, and also the wines that you can make in this part of the on this part of Italy, and there is always some uh, cooling uh, air that come down from the Dolomites that are very close to us. Now, obviously, this isn't a white or red, uh, I'm sorry, rosé region uh, per se, but you're making rosé from which grape varieties? So Valpolicella is very well known for reds, but Verona is also very well known for the Chiaretto. Chiaretto is the rosé that we produce. We use the same grape variety that we use to produce uh, the Valpolicella and the Bardolino. So they are we are focusing in Corvina, Rondinella and Molinara. But Bertani has a very unique approach to rosé. And for our rosé, we are using most of predominantly is made by Molinara. Molinara is a local grape variety that was not anymore, you're not anymore allowed to use in the Marone. And the reason it was just because it is very pale in terms of color, but that is fantastic to produce this lovely peach light coral color of rosé uh, with a very salty character in the palate. Excellent. And are you doing a uh... A direct to press or signe? What is your method? So we use uh, our rosé, let's say that is in, in the middle between a, a, a classic by the glass Provence style of rosé that is made by press normally, but there is also some a little bit of creepy character, more crunchiness that is more gastronomic. So for that reason, we use most of the for more let's say 80% is made by press, direct press, and 20% it is from Senior, in order to give a little bit of more complexity, more crunchiness, just an emotion of tannins in the palate to give more vibrancy. Beautiful. Well, uh, Bertani is one of the leading brands in Italy. It's certainly at the top of the charts for uh, Valpolicella and uh, Amorone. And so when uh, when presented with this rosé, I thought it was spectacular, and I love the uh, the food implications. What is a what is a great dish in in, in Verona that you would have with uh, your rosé? My best time for rosé is for sure a perfect time, but I can have also a glass of rosé with my little panino in the morning at 10 o'clock when we stop for a little break 
this is during summertime for me is the fantastic. He has a beautiful match with some uh, suppressor and a crunchy bread. This is fantastic way to match. Uh, except otherwise, uh, for sure, before before dinner in the evening is absolutely very good. I love rosé with uh, uh, poulet also with so ch chicken. That is for me a very good match, and also it's quite very nice, you know, if you also grab a piece of Parmesan cheese, very saline, very crispy in the palate, it's matching very, very well. Well, thank you for joining our Stars of Rosé. We're thrilled to have your wine in the lineup, and we can't wait to visit you in Italy, and we hope that 2021 is uh, onward and upward for you, sir. Uh, for sure, and uh, enjoy. Well, we. I want to uh, ask: Doesn't uh, his his voice sound a little bit like the the pasture in the movie Hangover? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I love it. You know what I'm talking about? Absolutely. Well, um, uh, it's he's definitely awesome. hard to follow that up for sure. Yeah, he's he is a, a super charming uh, gent and uh, his wines are legendary around the world. I'd love to uh, have people ask you any questions about this wine because I think it's probably, you know, the most unique wine in the, in the, in the lineup tonight. When you smell that wine, you, you're taken to Italy and you smell all types of Italian herbs and spices and wow. olives. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a really cool wine because it's, it's historic too. They've been actually making this wine since the 1930s. Um, it's just a really fresh, lively style, and they actually ferment the Molinara on skin and the Merlot off skin. So it's, it's really unique in that way, also. And uh, another great value as well inside. You know, that's I think just another feather in the cap of rose is how much value these wines deliver because uh, you know all of the uh, all these wines are under 30 bucks and uh, they are champions in their categories and uh, really really delicious so it's really a, a fun offering and uh, we've got a great price on the Bertani it's not something you're gonna see everywhere but um, you know it's it's it's, it's really it's <laughs> it, it makes you want to drink more as I'm sitting here yeah I'm like, Little, my sal saliva gland is just going nuts talking about it because that acidity and that 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 um, food parability. There's nothing sweet about this wine. It really does kind of enhance the appetite. And uh, uh, you know, I've got a lot of it, Ital Italy on my mind. We just launched a trip to uh, Piedmont today on the website. If you want to go to Piedmont with me in November 2021, look at learnaboutwine.com. We're going to Barolo, going truffle hunting, going, uh, gonna see some top producers, eat a, some amazing Fasoni cow, raw, chopped up on a plate. If you don't like uh, raw meat, uh, just earmuffs. <laughs> but uh, uh, we, that they're famous for the Fasoni uh, tartare and uh, and the white truffles for sure are going to be. That's why we picked November plus. Them, uh, I'm bullish on, uh, you know, the European market starting to open up and we can all still buy our uh, refundable airfares right now. So you should join us if you can. The trip is a relative value. If we do a trip to France this year, it's going to cost double. So we wanted to find something we could do in a really affordable way and um, kind of get us get our, 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 our feet back under us on the travel side. So um thank you for being here and listening to me um but uh, you <laughs> that's usually what your partner does down here in southern cal <laughs> you know michael is amazing he knows so much about the italian wine it's incredible i've learned a lot from him great italian chef michael so uh he knows all the top uh he knows where all the italians bury their bodies down here <laughs> well thank you very much uh greg how are we doing on the auction right now um, I think a lot of people are enjoying the wine right now, but uh, thank you for uh, to Lisa Test. She uh, she opened up the bidding on that uh, that that rosé case that we have. But again, just give it a look when you have a chance. We're we're going till Sunday night at 9 p.m. Tons of great stuff on there. If you're into uh, 
some virtual cooking. We've got a virtual cooking class to learn uh, Greek cooking, seafood, vegan, pastry chef, uh, 30 minute Zoom virtual to, uh, to do so much different cooking stuff. So we have about six of those up there along with um, some great wine items. Did those trips come in for us, Greg? I didn't see them. It on does, the yep. We have uh, one to Waikiki and we have a nice five day trip to uh, Tucson and Scottsdale. Far, far out. Yeah, so give those a look. They're um, reasonably priced. And again, everything that uh, you bid on supports Children's Hospital. Awesome. Is there any golf in those packages? Yes, of course. Yeah, you get uh, two rounds of golf with the golf cart and uh, breakfast every morning. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so that's over at the JD uh, JW uh, Marriott. Marriott properties. Very, very cool. They're very supportive. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Greg. And uh, we're running just a little bit late, but uh, that's because I'm just kind of really enjoying the rosé a little bit too much, maybe. <laughs> But uh, I want to thank you guys for your patience and we'll get, we're not going to get caught up. We're just going to finish a little late. Um, but here comes up. It's time for Urban Provence. Um, and I want to welcome from the brand Ultimate Provence, sorry, uh, that's up. <clears throat> and we're going to welcome Victor LaBelle to our Zoom tonight. Hi, guys. Hi. How are you? Outstanding. How are you, Victor? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me tonight. Where are you Zooming from today? So I'm not going to lie. This is uh, what we kind of use, you know, for the past year. So that's a, an actual picture of the estate. But uh, I'm, I'm in New York right now. So like travel has been difficult for me, you know, to go back to France. So, yeah, I wish I was in Provence, but I am not. All right. So it's yeah. not it's not that late for me. It's not like three a.m. like four <laughs> it's, it's eleven p.m. So that's that's fine. Okay. Well, I appreciate your patience. Um, but yeah, when I saw that picture in your background, I was like, wait a second, is he at the winery? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish I wish I was, but no. All okay. right. Well, thank you for joining us. I'm going to get right into our PowerPoint. Yeah. And, um, so yeah. <clears throat> we've had your wine on the website for the last uh, year and a half or so, and uh, sold quite a bit of it. This is a, probably one of our best selling wines. Um, and so I wanna thank you guys for being here um, and I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, but thank you so much. Thank you uh, everybody for joining us uh, tonight. So my name is Victor, I'm originally from Champagne region, which is northeast of France, but then I moved to Provence and I spent quite a lot of time in Provence with the winemaker and I moved like three years ago in, in the US to, to kind of represent the brand there. So today I'm just gonna talk, I'm gonna try to go quick because I know we're running a bit uh, late and there is someone also from Provence uh, after me. But I just wanted to show you first where Provence uh, was located. Obviously like it's in France, but um, it's in fact in the Southeast uh, region of France, which is really known as like the French Riviera, this lifestyle things where it's kind of the Californian like weather or like really sunny, etc. But what you kind of need to know about Provence, and I think people don't really know it, Provence is in fact one uh, of the first uh, wine region in France. It's in fact the oldest wine region. And all this comes from the history uh, of, you know, France and the Roman Empire, when in fact they moved from Italy, they kind of started to settle in Marseille, which is one of the biggest uh, uh, we have in the south of France. So they started being there, uh, you know, back before uh, uh, Crete. So they, they started like settling in Provence. They started to grow some grapes uh, there. And that's how like Rosé came because of the weather and etc. But then in fact, being in Provence, they kind of went to the west part of France. So they went to Bordeaux, they went in the north part of France, they went to Rhone Valley, uh, Burgundy and Champagne. So uh, what is kind of uh, unique. Uh, first, it's, it's about the history and the fact that Provence is the oldest wine uh, region. We can we can move uh, on the next slide. So this is also something I think like everybody was kind of talking about it, uh, and I think that's also important to keep it in mind. Uh, in French, we call this terroir, but terroir is in fact like a combination of different things. And I think the terroir is really important, uh, whether you are in France, in Provence or also like in, in, in California, in Los Angeles, everywhere you have a specific terroir. And this is part also of the uniqueness 
of the appellation of Provence and probably the, also the uniqueness of, of ultimate Provence. So for me, terroir is a combination of like four things. Uh, it's kind of a simple way to see that, but uh, you will have first inspect the soil, so you get different type of soil, whether or not you are in Provence. But even though you are in Provence, you will get different type of soil. So for me, for example, uh, Provence is 80%, it's a limestone soil. But 20%, which is more like south of Provence, when you get closer to the sea, you are more on this like crystalline schist soil, which is the kind of soil we have on ultimate Provence. Obviously, you have the climate. Uh, climate can change depending on where you are. Uh, you all know that. But Provence has a specific climate. Uh, as well, really sunny with like a specific wind, what we call mistral, that helps to clean the vines, uh, you know, naturally. Uh, so it's kind of a help uh, from nature. Uh, so that's why we are also lucky uh, to get this climate because we don't use that much, uh, you know, pesticide and chemical product behind because we don't have necessarily like a lot of diseases. Then you have people, obviously. So the uh, people on 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 the, on this day working the vines. The, uh, you know, the wine cellar, the, the, the wine shop, everybody, and the know-how. So this is a big part of Provence. Obviously, Provence has been producing rosé since uh, the beginning. Uh, we are well known for rosé, even though we do white and red. For us, it represents probably like 10% of the production. So 90% of our production is all about rosé. Uh, this is one slide of Alexis Cornu. Alexis Cornu is a winemaker of um, uh, the estate. Uh, he has been like with us for the past five years, getting like tremendous, you know, um, journalist inputs, meaning like gold medals and good ratings. So it's really well known uh, in, in Provence now. Um, and he, he did like quite a bit of uh, a big journey uh, in the world before to settle like in Provence, but he went to uh, different countries in the world to, you know, really master in the art of winemaking. Uh, and we will have a short video of Alexi afterwards. He couldn't make it obviously tonight, but it will be there on the on the recorded video. So that's a map, uh, the map of Provence. So you see from the east uh, part on the top right corner, uh, you have in fact um, Nice, uh, which is kind of a well-known city. And then on the on the left part, the west part, you have Marseille. And kind of right in the middle, you have Saint Tropez, which is kind of this city really well known. Uh, about lifestyle and you know like party city kind of but then um, you get four estates as you can see you have four different names on this page is because we are the owner of four different estates all in Provence so Provence is what we do uh, the, the name of the company is called MDCV and Ultimate Provence the one we will try uh, tonight is one of them and is in fact located as you can see a bit more like south closer to the sea closer to Saint-Tropez on this like schist um, crystalline soil uh, with a very specific climate over um, but it's a really short video just to show you a bit uh, what ultimate provence looked like um, it's kind of ultimate provence was um, let's say um, like a, a vision <laughs> musical interlude there sorry about that i don't know if i warned you we we're gonna play that <laughs> thank you no so i will job. i will i will go through a, a tiny bit more to explain you what is ultimate provence just uh, probably after we have another video uh, right after about alexi cornu he's just gonna give you kind of what the signature of ultimate provence and then i will give you some uh, some inputs on on the estate okay forgets 
everything you know about wine. Ultime Provence is a unique estate. It's magnificent. It's very close to saint tropez but it's very quiet. It's right within a national park. And uh, so nature well preserved all around. And uh, the wines are grown on very different soils, on crystalline soils with schists. And we have a lot of Syrah varieties with a touch of Vermentino as well. So our blends are bold, are fragrant, are intense, and they match very well with the food, um, with many food, Asian food, fusion food. Uh, I personally uh, uh, enjoy a lot uh, raw fish. You know, I, I lived and worked a year in Japan, and uh, that's my favorite uh, match. Up and uh, raw fish, sushi, sashimi. Let's try it. So, um, yeah, we, we can go on the next slide. So um, maybe just okay. because you, you saw it on the on the video, but I was probably not clear enough. But so Ultimate Provence, it's, it's an estate, obviously. Uh, we bought it like about like six years ago and we have redone everything on site because that was the vision of the owner and his son. What they wanted to do was to make like a, an estate accessible like to a younger generation, what we call like millennials, or younger crowd because um, you know Provence used to be kind of really um, exclusive you know difficult sometimes for younger generation to understand what was Provence so by doing ultimate Provence that was really just okay you have to come as you are you can come for a day uh, you can come and have fun you can you can really enjoy and and touch the lifestyle of Provence so when you get inside in fact you go straight straight from the cellar that you see which is kind of unusual, but that's the main entrance. And then on the estate, we propose like a restaurant on site. We have a uh, we have a nice terrace uh, with a bar, a cocktail bar where we do rosé cocktail, um, and we have also like a, a, a kind of a boutique hotel. So that's we have we have done this really like just to kind of we love people, we want to welcome people. Obviously, with the the, the last year. Uh, it was it was difficult, but now we are reopening and we are so pleased to do that and welcome uh, again some people. So it's a smaller estate uh, than the one we we had, like Chateau de Bern, which is the biggest one. But we are talking about 114 uh, uh, acres of, of, of vines. Um, we have only one uh, wine, uh, which is the Ultimate Provence, so the one you are trying tonight. Uh, it's a 2019 vintage. Um, we can go on, on the next slide so I, I can uh, introduce about the wine. Um, I think when we talk about the wine now, what is important just to remember with Ultimate Provence is a Syrah, so Shiraz Lead um, uh, Rosé, which is um, kind of, you know, unusual, but at the same time usual. In Provence, we have three main grapes, uh, which are like the Grenache, the Canso, uh, and the Syrah. But for Ultimate, we have really, really nice Syrah on the estate because of the terroir we have. So Syrah will be the lead on, on the on the blends, and you get a bit of Grenache and so, and a tiny bit of, of Vermontino. I mean, for us, it's roll, but Vermontino as well, which is a cuisine. So for us, Syrah will give to the wine this nice, you know, spiciness, white pepper nut. Um, then we get this citrus type fruit, and you get also like the freshness, the brightness of the wine coming back with the roll. So I think it's a really good like balanced wine. Uh, we are really looking to to be more than just a simple like summer type thing. So I kind of agree with uh, what the uh, my colleague told at the beginning, saying like you know you you should try to drink the rosé not too cold because with ultimate you need to be a bit uh, warmer on your glass so you can really feel all these these aromas. Because we are more looking for a, a, a kind of a pairing rosé than just simply like a rosé for summer that is really good when it's cold and when you cannot feel anything. So for me, that's a good pairing wine. 90 points, one enthusiast, three years in a row. So we are getting really good feedback on the wine. Um, and you know, like at the end, it's a light and dry rosé. So it will always be like easy drinking, perfect for all occasions. But I really recommend like if you have some food tonight to try to pair with some food. So it can be cheeses or meat or whatever you have, I'm pretty sure it will, it will match perfectly. Fantastic. And then it's just the one slide more, I think about uh, just yeah, tasting notes about the wine and what you can, you can feel, but I always feel, you know, tasting it's so personal. So I will leave this to you and just tell me what you think about the wine. And if you have any question. 
Beautiful, beautiful. Anyone have a question for our, our friend sitting in New York from Provence? Well, actually from Champagne. But, uh, <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we enjoy it. The, I will tell you that holding this bottle in my hand, I've had uh, all my staff, when we pour these wines, they're like, can I take that bottle? Can I take that bottle? It's a beautiful package. Um, thank you. Yeah, packaging is really kind of important for us. We have uh, quite different packaging, even like for the other states. Uh, Ultimate Provence was really trying to, to do something really elegant and it was in fact um, uh, inspired by, uh, you know, like a uh, perfume bottle. So that's kind of how we, we went there. But it's, it's just something elegant straight to the point with this uh, uh, nice, uh, you know, lines on the, on the bottle. It's gorgeous. Well, thank you so much, sir. We're going to move down the road and, uh, meet, uh, my friend Noreen Lyons, who's on the zoom with us tonight from domain art. Hello, Noreen. Hi everyone. I'm trying to find you on my zoom page. I think you are in there. I found you. Last but not least, leaving the best for last. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I hope you don't mind, Victor. <laughs> if you knew Noreen, she's definitely the best. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. So, uh, <clears throat> Noreen, we're, we're tasting Bayat tonight. Uh, have you seen the slides? Are you ready to go through the show? Do you want to say yeah. anything? Yeah, go. let's do it. You have the video first, right? Yeah, let me let me open that up. Um, uh, this is with uh, this. Uh, let me see. We got the first. We know we changed the order a little bit. We put the video of the just to establish the mood of where this is. Okay. Okay, and then we'll do the interview. Great. The all important music. <laughs> the fruits of your labor, extracting the nectar that gives life to the finest Cru in Provence. Take your time, all the time you need, to work in silence in the secrecy of the countryside. Time whose boundaries we constantly defy, time that slips through our fingers, never suspending its flight. Here we follow the rhythm of time, taming the untamed minutes, it's second nature. Like you, time is our loyal friend. Together we work the land to preserve our heritage, the richness of our three domains. Cultivating this valuable asset requires a great deal of patience. You have to keep to the beat, have a sense of rhythm, tick, Talk, tick, talk. Times change, seasons come and go, but the most important things are never lost. History draws us closer, shows us that the way ahead is always clear. To preserve our history, we proceed without haste, confident that our savoir-faire takes root in our savoir-vivre. Savor the colors of time. That's a voice. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> That's great. I'm, uh, now we're going to we're going to meet with Christopher. Now Christopher is the uh, estate director for uh, Domain Art. I got to talk with him a, a couple weeks a, weeks ago. Was the art for such a long time? The family is established in Provence since 1996. That's a very long history. The fundator of the vineyard, Marcelo, arrived in Provence from Alsace. He moved from Alsace to Provence in 1996 with the idea to produce great rosé wine. And uh, so we've got the history, we've got the, the 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 legal the laws that have elevated the brand with uh, 
you know, a lot of uh, uh, focus on quality. Um, we've got this beautiful package and stylistically the wines uh, always have this, this beauty and this, uh, this, this touch, this quality touch. What is it that uh, you guys do to the wine to give it that added polish? Is it uh, uh, the way the wine is made, the way the wine is grown? Uh, what, where, where is the quality found? 70% of our job is the vineyard. The way how we run the vineyard. If you have good grapes, you can produce very good wine. We run our vineyards, the free vineyards, exactly in the same way and in all any way. So beautiful grapes arriving in the wine cellar. And then it's a direct press through the wine. It has nothing to do with the rosé de semi, which exists all over the world. Mm. Dominant, it's a direct press through the wine, maximum two hours skin contact. Mm. So when you have maximum two hours skin contact, in order to have this beautiful color, color you need to have beautiful grapes arriving in the wine cellar. We need about one hour to fulfill our pneumatic press machine. The pneumatic press machine accepts 40 tons. We fulfill it manually, so we need one hour. So during this first hour, we have a skin contact. When the machine is full, we close it, and then we have a very gentle price, the press, sorry, during one hour with a different program. And we press maximum 60% of our grapes to obtain the best juice. We do not press the grapes directly after the harvest. We put them in a refrigerative truck during one night. We cool down the temperature to avoid oxidation and to keep the aromas. And we make the pressing the day after. And we have three analog three winemakers on each vineyard. So the menu, you know, it's really hot couture for Rosé wine because this is three vineyards, three times the staff to run the vineyard, three times the staff to run the wine cellar, three analog, uh, three uh, labeling machine, three bottling machine. So it's really hot couture for Rosé wine. Mm. And we invest, it's a long history, it's 130, sorry. But nevertheless, we invest a lot of money in the vineyard to have a beautiful vineyard and a young vineyard. The middle age of the vineyard is 25 years, 25 mm. years old. We produce rosé wine, so we need to have a very young vineyard to produce very fresh rosé wine. So it's a lot of things, a lot of things which have been added to be sure that in the end we have a beautiful rosé wine. Very limited. You can imagine that uh, it's a uh, it's about a two, it's a 260 hectares. So you have to make the difference in acres. 260 hectares on production. And from these 260 hectares on production, we produce 800,000 bottles of vintage wine. So it's a very small production in regards of the full capacity of the three vineyards together. For sure. Domainat, this is a legendary brand, Noreen. Thank you for sh telling us about it tonight. Yes, it's pretty much the gold standard of Provence. So the one you're drinking right there is a blend of, so they have three vineyard sites, one in Bandol that you can see on the map that's kind of greenish. Um, and then in the red area are the two sites that you're drinking right now. So it's a blend of the Clos Muret, which was founded in 1936, and then the uh, Chateau de Sel, which was the first one founded in 1912. And yeah, it's delicious. I hope you enjoy it. It's a blend of Grenache, Cinso, and Syrah. And um, so yeah, so that's the the Bandol property, Chateau Romasson. And then that's Chateau de Sel. So that's the original from 1912. Basically, they wanted to find the best site to, after phylloxera, the best site to, to plant grapes and make a great quality wine. After phylloxera, a lot of people in Provence were just making what they could because they had to just make wine and survive. And so he talks about time or they talk about time in that first video you played and they definitely took their time and they found the right spot. And then, so this was actually where the, this was where, the, this was home to the Count of Provence right here, what you're looking at. Oh, wow. And, yeah. 
So that's Chateau de Sel. And then um, on the left, that's Claude Muret. And on the right, so these, it's always been a family business. They are now two cousins, fourth generation is Jean Francois and Christian Ott. And they are the descendants that's carrying Domaine Ott today. And they're keeping with the same traditions and that, they're, that their four founders did. Oh, and then that's the, that's Chateau de Sel. They made a state-of-the-art new winery and they used this Parisian architect. Um, his name's Frederick Svensted, Carl Frederick Svensted. And he's, uh, yeah, he lives in Paris and it's, it's gorgeous. I can't wait to go see it myself. Awesome. Well, the wine is uh, drinking very odd like it is. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, we can, you know, maybe share uh, show of hands. How many of you have tried Domain Ott before? It is, uh, you know, it is a, a, a there are a lot of brands in the world that kind of shape the industry that follows them. And Domain Ott is certainly one of those wineries um, tends yeah. to be on the the super premium side of the rosé business. This is um, their most affordable offering, but it's also one of the hardest ones to get because it's uh, there's there's not a lot of wine for the world and the, the demand for these wines are pretty high. So we wouldn't have this wine available to us if it wasn't for Noreen. So thank you, Noreen. Thank you. Yeah, and I see a question. Someone's asking, so the Bayat is Provence and Domaine Ott is Vandal. So it's all Provençal wine. Um, Domaine Ott makes three crews. The, the Bandol one called Chateau Romasson, the Chateau de Sel, and the Chateau Muret. And those three are, are sold out. We're waiting for the 2020, 2020s to come in. So hopefully by next month. Um, but this is, this is a blend of those two. So they do make, as far as rosé, they make four. And then they do make a white and a red as well. Yeah. And uh, this is a problem for the entire wine industry. All of the 2020s were probably due in by the first week of June or maybe the sometime in May. But because of all the, the back logging in the ports and the harbors, a um, lot. I mean, you try to buy Sancerre right now in the state of California and there is zero. Uh, it is uh, all the wine sitting in, in container ships and every day that's going to change and improve here very rapidly because they've, they're they all like six to eight, maybe 12 weeks late. So yeah, it's, it's the, all landing the, right now. Yeah. And a, a lot of wine sitting in ports because the ports can't handle all the, all the containers coming in. Yeah. But uh, that will correct and there will be some more supply coming by the end of the year. But uh, for right now, uh, we have what we have on the website and we have more than anybody else. So we thank you for that, Noreen. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we hope you guys enjoyed the Domain Ott. Does anybody have any, any comments about Domain Ott or any of the rosés? Janice, how are you doing? You've been very attentive. Thank you so much. Do you have any questions for, uh, for me or, uh, or any comments, any favorites? I'll uh, un unmute you. Let me unmute that button. Smash that unmute. I actually think that I like this, this number seven, the Domain Ott, the best. Oh. It's my favorite. Nice. Thank you. It, it has minerals and acid for days. Yeah, we, we had to put it last because it will uh, tear your teeth apart. It's a perfect way to cleanse the, the palate. Okay, someone's asking, does Louis Roder own Domain Ott? Yes, they do. Domain Ott is owned by Champagne Louis Roder. Mm. Which Noreen works for. Yes, so we might see her again on a Champagne Zoom. That's who, my, that's who my checks come from. <laughs> Far out. Melvin J., what did you like tonight? Sorry about that. I, I, my favorite was... Um the the uh, ultimate provence sorry and yours is a very close second but <laughs> 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 uh, all in all uh, uh, it, 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 it was a very enjoyable evening we haven't been giant um, um rosé fans but i think you're uh, 
you're introducing us to a, uh, a whole new world. Well, great. You know, this time of the year, gosh, we're going to see, you know, 90 plus degree temperatures for a little while. And uh, as just as that sun is setting in the sky and we get these tapestry like skies for the summer, there's nothing better than a glass of rosé to celebrate the day. This is a really a, a great moment for rosé and uh, it's a great value. I mean, even, you know, uh, some of the some of our pricier rosés, they're, they're, they're still a total steal and a value. And they're made with, uh, you know, a sense of urgency to get them to marketplace, but they're, you know, really artisanal and the way they put them together and they're all about aromatics and uh, that, that mouthfeel. And uh, some of them age very nicely. I you know last year during the pandemic, we sold a ton. Last year was 2020. We sold a ton of 2017 rosés and uh, some of them, you know, uh, some of the producers, uh, whether they're stuck on boats or or you know that some of the producers are 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 still in the 18 19 range and that's absolutely okay um and in fact in some some areas some of these wines get more interesting they get they add weight they get more complexity there's a freshness and a vibrancy that may dissipate a little bit but the but it turns into more complexity and so i like rosés that are one or two or three years old especially when they come from really good land with really good intentions. Um, the Tavel Rosé that we're going to show on Saturday night is a 19. Um, and it's just starting to get interesting because when those wines are too young, they don't, they're just massive and they'll beat you up. But uh, these wines age gracefully. And uh, just like champagne, it really surprises people how well they age. Well, uh, we've uh, traversed the uh, world. We had someone on a Zoom tonight from 3.30 in the morning in Europe. And Noreen, it's not, you're not in Provence, so. Uh, I wish. Yeah, <laughs> all of us do. And, uh, but maybe we could visit uh, the, uh, the ultimate Provence estate uh, on our tour. If we go to Provence next year, um, thinking March and March just before the rush, because April gets really crazy busy. Um, and uh, we want to be there before all the kids get out of school for April spring break. Uh, so uh, I'm thinking of late April, late March next year. If you guys want to go, let me know. Send me a note. I only take 10 people. I don't like to babysit. That's what we're doing with our trip to uh, our trip to Piedmont. And if you'll allow me to show you our trip to Piedmont. We have worked our butt off getting this done, but uh, yes, things are, are starting to, to happen. We have our first live event this Friday night. We're doing a, 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 a little show called The Pink Party and it's very casual. We're just showing all of the stars of, uh, of Rosé. We're playing some music, getting some people together. If you want to come, there's still tickets available. They are only available in advance though. It will be pretty intimate. There'll be less than 50 people there but it'll just be a really nice way to get some good people in the room and, and talk wine and, and, and celebrate life. Um, but we're going to Piedmont, Italy in November, November 28th. This is really happening. Um, and it's all about the truffle season. Here's the list of the producers we're intending to see. And we've got uh, tentative appointments. Of course, last year we did a, an amazing Zoom with the Conterno family. So we've got them on the line. Um, I'm a huge fan of Marscarello, Caviolotto, Rinaldi. We're going to talk about seeing uh, um, either uh, uh, either of the Pira uh, representatives. Um, and we've got to see uh, the Rizzi family. And, and so uh, just really amazing. This is probably the newest winery in Barolo. Really, really crazy cool. And some of the best food coming out of this Barolo producer here. But uh, Chiara Baskis is, is the name I was looking for right there. Um, so that's that's kind of our, our list of producers. We got a great hotel we're going to be staying at. Um, and I love staying at this hotel every time I go to Piedmont. It's right down the street from all the top restaurants. 
So we've got a day where we see some amazing producers. We go take a look at some hazelnut production and forests and learn all about the hazelnut industry. Of course, that's where all the great hazelnut products come from. And then we'll go uh, truffle hunting with the, the dogs and uh, learn that from a master truffle hunter. We'll do a cooking class um, and uh, each day visiting wineries, but doing a little bit more than just wine, wine, wine and a, a nice casual pace. We want to enjoy it. Um, and it takes a thousand dollar deposit. The trip is 3,995 euro, which uh, today uh, got a little cheaper because the dollar got a 1% stronger just today. So um, uh, that's a real great value to be able to do that. That includes all the buses, all the meals, all the tours, tastings, um, just a, a few nights out on our own, which you'll enjoy because we can go to any of the taverns and pubs and restaurants in the neighborhood of the hotel and just totally chillax, which is gonna be amazing because the hospitality there is awesome and uh, can't wait to take you. Only 10 people go on this trip as well. So with that, we want to thank you guys all for being with us. And Noreen, thank you very much. I know your baby's there. So we're going to get you uh, out of here. But uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. And uh, um, Renee, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Thank you. Michelle Smith, everything good? Lovely. Elizabeth Beck Bickford, thank you guys for, for laughing at my jokes and listening to my music. Uh, Abel, everything good with you, buddy? Thank you so much for being here tonight. Josh Boxer, I see your dog in the background making an appearance. Indeed. She enjoyed it as well. Thanks so much. All right. Awesome. Nancy Nickerson, thank you. You made it on, on the Zoom. Did you hear us? Some of you haven't seen for a while, but it's good to have you here tonight. We're going to be announcing tomorrow our Stars of Pinot Noir which is our annual July gathering. And uh, you're gonna be pretty impressed with the wine list. I wouldn't have been able to get the wine list quite this good if I had to get all these producers to uh, Southern California. So we would do it on Zoom. Uh, we'll do it uh, on multiple nights like we're doing it with Rosé. Uh, but wait till you see the wine list. It's, it's pretty insane. We don't have it quite ready for, for our Zoom to show it off tonight, but it probably will be up on the website tomorrow. Well, it will be because the ad's going out tomorrow to announce it. And it's coming at us pretty fast. It's only about three weeks away. Um, so check, check it out if you wanna join us. Um, it's gonna be a little more limiting than some of our Zooms, just on the nature of some of the wines that we're gonna be showing off. But uh, Greg, everything good? All good. Thank you. Uh, you know, thank you for everybody for checking out the auction. Runs till Sunday night. And if you guys have uh, bid on some of the auctions that we've done in the past, um, we've done them all individual. And this time we um, we packaged them up to two great cases, featuring all the wines from tonight and Saturday. And we still don't have a bid yet on that uh, Miraval three liter. So oh. jump on that. We have that at like thirty percent off retail. <clears throat> Well, uh, definitely uh, note that that will be available until Sunday. There's only one of them, um, but that is the ultimate baller way to go to a party with your friends uh, is to walk into a big party with a three liter of rosé in your hand. And yeah. if you ever need one, just contact me and we'll find one for you. Um, but they they sell for a super premium. Um, yeah, actually, so I said 30 percent. I should have said 70 percent because, you know, we're starting at one hundred dollars, which is yeah, when we did that uh, that bottle, similar bottle at our uh, rosé tasting in Beverly Hills, the, they were selling it on the auction table for over a thousand dollars for the three liters. Um, that's that's a lot, but but the but people wanted that bottle, so it's a really fun uh, thing to walk into a room with. There's uh, the big format bottles are special. They are they're not just four bottles of wine but they're extra special because the glass bottle itself is worth so much. So yeah. um, uh, really a fun way to, to live there. And um, I and if you wind up winning that stuff, you know, it's available for pickup at the Learn About Wine offices, or we could uh, deliver it at a small fee. Yeah, we uh, also can deliver it with any wine purchase for free. 
so that's how we do it um, around here. You know, our wine delivery is free, but only until the middle of July, everybody. Um, our free delivery is going to be going away pretty soon as the uh, delivery services are getting insane. They don't, they can't even find staff. They're piring up, paying a lot more. So they're bringing me a much larger bill. So we're going to have a new, a new way of doing things going into the future, but, uh, it's, we're going to keep it affordable and it'll be able to back out some of the delivery fees that we have to put into the prices of our wine. So we'll keep our wines really, really affordable. And then you always get the 10% off on the 12 bottles, uh, any assortment of 12 bottles. Buy a $5 bottle and uh, get that 12, that 10% discount if you if you uh, want to play the game. But get to 12 bottles and uh, we're going to have the best price in the country on almost every wine on our website. So with that, Greg, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun and uh, delicious and refreshing. I'm feeling like a million bucks. I'm ready to go out and have a good time now. I hope you guys are uh, uh, doing all right. And uh, to my friends that were up all night in Europe, thank you so much for uh, making the Zoom. Um, but you guys have a great night. Cheers, all. See you.